We say greetings to everyone as we uh, quickly approach our last Sunday in September. I greet you all in the name of our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ, who does all things well. And let us pray. Merciful and gracious God, once again, we thank you again for your many blessings. We thank you for leading and guiding us through this pandemic. We thank you for watching over us and protecting us from all hurt, harm, or danger, and even any matter of disease. Father God, we thank you this morning just for activities of our limb, portion of our health and strength, and being clothed in our right mind. And as we approach, Father God, going toward the end of this year, help us to stay focused on you. Help us to look unto Jesus, the author and the finisher of our faith. Help us to run our race with patience and endurance that we may finish what we started. Many have fell to the wayside, but help us, Father God, to stay focused on the narrow road that leads to eternal life. We thank you this morning. Bless this lesson. Bless your teachers. Bless everyone that view it. Bless everyone that share it. Thank you for the platform. It is in Jesus' name we pray. We say amen, amen, and amen again. Again, this is Pastor James Preston Daniels, pastor of the Friendship Missionary Baptist Church located in Volula, Alabama. Again, as we continue, this is part of the fall lesson, lesson number four, September the 26th, 2021. We're still in unit number one. God's people offer praise. Again, God's people offer praise. And our topic for this Sunday School lesson is celebrating in unity. Celebrating in unity. Our devotional reading comes from Psalms 134. Psalms 134. In our background scripture, it's Acts chapter 2, verse 32 through 33, and verses 37 through 47. And our printed passage is the same. Acts chapter 2, verse 32 through 33, and verse 37 through 47. And our key verse for this study says, and they continue steadfastly in the apostles' doctrine and fellowship and in breaking of bread and in prayers. Acts chapter 2, verse 42. And our lesson aims for this lesson, number one, understand Jesus' forgiveness of sin and the role of the Holy Spirit in your lives and in the life of the church. Number two, discern how the love of Jesus and the gift of the Holy Spirit inspire believers of different backgrounds to share a life of worship, care, and witness. Number three, plan opportunities for persons to encounter the Holy Spirit and begin a relationship with Jesus Christ through the ministries of the church. Our key terms for this lesson is one, forgiveness, which simply means dismissal, release, to be pardoned, and remission. Number two, praising, to praise or to extol. Number three, raised up, which means to raise from the dead or to raise in life. Number four, repent, which is to change one's mind or purpose. Number five, witnesses, which is an eyewitness or ear witness. And number six, wonders, portents, marvels, or a miraculous event. A biblical context for this lesson 
reminds us that the book of Acts is commonly known as the actions of the apostles. Acts chapter 2 is titled, The Day of Pentecost and the Birth of the Church. Because Passover and Pentecost were only about seven weeks apart, many Jewish pilgrims would remain in Jerusalem to celebrate both sacred festivals. The communal arrangements described in Acts chapter 2, verse 44 through 45, and Acts chapter 4, verse 32 through 35, are spoken nowhere else in the New Testament, leading some religious scholars to believe that sharing all things in common in the, Jer in the Jerusalem church was a way to provide for displaced pilgrims, as well as others with limited means who chose to stay in the region past the Passover festivals into the period of Pentecost activities. This lingering crowd represent a diverse mix of people from throughout the region. Jews who lived outside Jerusalem or further across the land will make the pilgrimage of the annual feast days. This presented the apostles and leaders of the early church with the unique opportunity to share the message of salvation through Jesus with a broader audience. Sowing seeds that ultimately led to the spread of the gospel in new regions. On the day of Pentecost, Peter, having been filled with the Holy Spirit, seized the moment as he stood before the crowd of thousands, boldly declared the gospel message. By the power of the Holy Spirit, people open up their hearts, receive the truth, and ask how they could respond to the good news Peter delivered. When we look at our introduction, it reminds us many friendship circles, social clubs, and civic organization speak highly of fellowship and unity. Their members often gather to tell stories and reminisce on old times. The mood of their gathering may be festive and energetic, full of life. Most often, people have strong, enduring loyalties to the groups to which they belong, such that no matter the story, the arguments, and the crisis, or even the outcome, they remain unified and loyal in support of the common cause to take a common stand. No matter how high or low life takes you, at some point, you will acknowledge the human need for friendship and fellowship. There is an unspeakable beauty in gathering together without worries of judgment or cares for the world, to share burdens and to celebrate life, blessing, struggles, and triumphs. Instead of lamenting or crying what is not, we can be agents of peace, unity, truth, and love. Ralph Waldo Emerson noted that each of us has the capacity to impact our surrounding with such beauty. He said, though we travel the world over to find beauty, we must carry it with us or we find it not. This lesson matters because celebration brings about unity in a new way of seeing 
and being in the world. Psalms 133 and one reminds us, it said, behold, how good and pleasant it is for brethren to dwell together in unity. This lesson focuses on the first Christian community who heard the gospel message and was inspired by the Holy Spirit to see the world differently and to be united to live, worship, and evangelize together. God has called the body of Christ to a shared experience of love and unity with persons of various ethnic, social, and cultural boundaries. Without the Spirit of the Lord, such unity would not just be elusive, but also nearly be impossible. In Christ, in Christ, there is no division, for we are one in faith and love because of him. In other words, God is no respectful of person. He offers salvation to everyone who believes. We have three outlines for this lesson. And our first outline speaks of the pricking, the pricking. Acts chapter two, verse 32 through 33, and verse 37 through 38. In verse 32, the scripture reads, this Jesus having God raised up, whereof we are witnesses. Verse 33, therefore being by the right hand of God exalted and having received of the Father the promise of the Holy, Holy Ghost, he have shed forth this, which ye now see and hear. Verse 37, now when they heard this, they were pricked in their hearts and said unto Peter, and to the rest of the apostles, men and brethren, what shall we do? And verse 38, then Peter said unto them, repent and be baptized every one of you in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sin, and ye shall receive the gift of the Holy Ghost. In Acts chapter 2, verse 25 through 28, the Apostle Peter quoted from Psalms 16, verse 8 through 11. In Psalm 16, David had written prophetically concerning the Lord's life, death, resurrection, and glorification. As to the resurrection of the Lord, David expressed confidence that God will show him the path of life. In Psalm 16, 11, a clause, David wrote, you will show me the path of life. And then in Acts chapter two, verse 28, a clause, Peter quoted it. You have made known to me the ways of of life. Peter changed the future tense to the past tense. The Holy Spirit obviously directed him to do this since the resurrection was now past. The present glorification of the Savior was predicted by David in words. You will make me full of joy in your presence. Or as Psalm 16 and 11 says, in your presence is fullness of joy. At your right hand are pleasures evermore. In verses 32 through 33, that must have shocked this Jewish audience. The Messiah whom David prophesied was Jesus of Nazareth. God had raised him from amongst the dead as the apostles could all testify because they were eyewitnesses to his resurrection. Following his resurrection, the Lord Jesus was exalted to the right hand 
of God. And now the Holy Spirit had been sent as promised by the Father. This was the explanation of what had happened in Jerusalem early in the day. In verse 36 through 37, now, once again, the announcement come crashing down upon the Jewish people. God had made both Lord and Christ, this Jesus whom you crucified. They had crucified God's anointed one and the coming of the Holy Spirit was evident that Jesus had been exalted in heaven. So mighty was the convicting power of the Holy Spirit that there was an immediate response from the audience. Without any invitation or appeal from Peter, they cried out, what shall we do? The question was prompted by a deep sense of guilt or conviction. That was power in God's word. For we are reminded, for the word of God is quick and powerful and sharper than any two-edged sword, piercing even to the dividing asunder of the soul and spirit, and of the joints and marrow, and is a discerner of the thoughts and the intents of the heart which is found in Hebrews chapter four, verse 12. They now realize that Jesus whom they had slain was God's beloved son. This Jesus had been raised from the dead and was now exalted in heaven. This being so, how could the guilty murderers rise possibly or rape be escaped from judgment. Peter's answer was that they should repent and be baptized in the name of Jesus Christ for the remission of sins. First, they were to repent, acknowledging their guilt and taking sides with God against themselves. Then they were to be baptized for or unto the remission of their sins. At first glance, this verse seems to teach salvation by baptism. And many people insist that this is precisely what it does mean. But can I encourage you today? Such an interpretation is impossible for the following reasons. Number one, in dozens of the New Testament passages, salvation is said to be by faith in the Lord Jesus Christ alone. Remember, the thief on the cross had the assurance of salvation apart from baptism. The Savior is not stated to have baptized anyone, a strange omission if baptism is essential, is essential to salvation. The Apostle Paul was thankful that he baptized a few of the Corinthians, a strange cause for thankfulness if baptism has saving merit. Now, some of these Jews had come to realize their mistake. By repentance, they acknowledged their sin to God. By trusting the Lord Jesus as their Savior, they were regenerated and received eternal forgiveness of sins. By public water baptism, they disassociated themselves from the nation that crucified the Lord and, and identified themselves with him. We should forget Lord Jesus' prayer on, we should never forget the Lord Jesus' prayer on the cross. Father, forgive them for they know not what they do. Baptism thus became the outward sign that their sins in connection with the rejection of Christ, as well as all other sins, had been simply washed away. It took 
it took them off Jewish ground and placed them on resurrection or Christian ground. But baptism did not save them. Only faith in Christ could do that. Peter assured them that if they repented and were baptized, they would receive the gift of the Holy Spirit. Adding souls to the kingdom is one of the greatest priorities of ministry. The Lord's church must never lose sight of her mission, which is a kingdom of gender. Witnessing and evangelism is every believer's duty in the advancement of God's kingdom. Our second outline speaks of the promise. The promise. Acts chapter 2, verse 39 through 42. Verse 39 says, For the promise is unto you, and to your children, and to all that are afar off, even as many as the Lord our God shall call. Verse 40, And with many other words did he testify and exhort, saying, Save yourselves from this untoward generation. Verse 41, Then they gladly received his word, were baptized. And the same day there was added unto them about 3,000 souls. Verse 42, And they continued steadfastly in their apostles' doctrine and fellowship and breaking of bread and in prayers. In verse 39, Peter now having people hooked with pricked hearts, further explain the promise of the Holy Spirit, which they would receive and to their children, the Jewish people, and to all who was afar off, simply meaning the Gentiles, even as many as God would call. The very people who had said his blood be on us and on our children are now assured of God's grace for themselves and their children if they would simply trust in the Lord. The important thing to notice is that the promise is not only to you and to your children, but to all who is afar off, as many as the Lord our God will call. It is all inclusive, as though whosoever of the gospel invitation. And you remember what that famous verse is, John 3, 16. For God so loved the world that he gave his only begotten son, that whosoever believeth in him should not perish, but have everlasting life. In verse 40, not all of Peter's message is recorded in this chapter. But the gist of the remainder was that the Jewish heroes would save themselves from a crooked, perverse generation that rejected and murdered the Lord Jesus. They could do this by receiving Jesus as their Messiah and Savior and by publicly declaiming any of the connection with the guilty nation of Israel through Christian baptism. In verse 41, there was a great forward surge of people desiring to be baptized as outward evidence that they had gladly received Peter's word as the word of the Lord. That were added to the company of believers that day about 3,000 souls. If the best proof of the Holy Spirit ministry is the conversion of souls, then surely, my brothers and sisters, Peter was that kind of ministry. Doubtless, this Galilean fisherman was reminded of the words of the Lord Jesus. Follow me and I will make you 
fishers of men, Matthew 4 and 19, or perhaps of the Savior saying, most surely I say to you, he who believes in me, the work that I do, he will do also, and greater work than these he will do, because I go to my Father. John chapter 14, verse 12. And then in verse 42, the proof for reality is in continuance. The songwriter suggests that we should let it be real. In everything that we do for Jesus, we ought to let it be real. These converts prove the reality of their profession by continuously steadfasting, number one, in the apostles' doctrine. This means the inspired teaching of the apostles. Number two, fellowship. Another evidence of new life was the desire of the believer to be with the people of God, sharing things in common with them. Number three, the breaking of bread. This expression is used in the New Testament to refer both to the Lord's Supper and to eating of a common meal. And number four, prayers. This was the fourth principle practice of the early church, and it expressed complete dependence on the Lord for worship, guidance, preservation, and service. The early church was committed to connecting and getting to know one another. Today, we're called together in fellowship and membership and partnership, and even in friendship. Now our third and final outline speaks of the praise. The praise. Acts chapter 2, verse 43 through 47. And verse 43 reads, And fear came upon every soul, and many wonders and signs were done by the apostles. Verse 44, and all that believed were together and had all things common. Verse 45, and sold their possessions and goods and parted them to all men as every man had need. Verse 46, and they continuing daily with one accord in the temple and breaking bread from house to house did eat their meat with gladness and singleness of heart and verse 47 praising God and having favor with all people and the Lord added to the church such as should he should be saved in verse 43 the powerful worship celebration at Pentecost moved people deeply leaving them in awe the mighty power of the Holy Spirit was so evident that hearts was hushed and subdued. Astonishment filled their souls as they saw the apostles performing many wonders and signs. Wonders were miracles which excited wonder and amazement. Signs were miracles designed to convey, convey instruction. A miracle could be both a wonder and a sign. In verse 44 through 45, the believers continuously assembled themselves and held all things in common trust. So mildly was the love of God shed abroad in their hearts that they did not look upon their material possession as their own. Whenever there was a genuine case of need and fellowship, they sold their personal property and distributed the proceeds. Thus, there was inequality. Many may argue today that we need not follow the early believers in this practice. One might just as well contend that we should not love our neighbors as ourselves. 
This sharing of all one's real estate and personal problem, personal property, was the inedible fruit of lives that were filled with the Holy Spirit. It has been said, a real Christian could not bear to have too much when others have too little. In verse 46, this verse gives the effects of Pentecost on religious life and home life. As to religious life, we must remember that these early converts were of Jewish background. Although the church was now in existence, the ties with the Jewish temple were not several immediately. The process of throwing off these grave clothes of Judaism continued throughout the period of Acts. And so the believer continued to attend the service in the temple where they heard the Old Testament being read and expound upon. In addition, of course, they met together in home for the function for the function of doctrine, fellowship, breaking of bread and prayers. As to their home life, we read that they broke bread taking that food with gladness and simplicity of heart. Here it seemed clear that the breaking of bread refers to the eating of regular meals with one another. The joy of their salvation overflowed in every detail of life, gilding the mundane with the aura of glory. In verse 47, Life became a anthem of praise and a psalm of thanksgiving for those who had been delivered from the power of darkness and translated into the kingdom of God's Son because of his love. At the outset, the believer had favor with all people, but this was not to last. The nature of the Christian faith is such that it inevitably stirs up hatred and opposition of the human heart. The Savior had warned his disciples to beware of popularity, which is outlined in Luke chapter 6, verse 26. He also reminded them the promise of persecution and tribulation outlined in Matthew chapter 10, verse 22 through 23. So this favor was a momentary phase soon to be replaced by unrelenting opposition. And the Lord added to the church daily those who were being saved. The Christian fellowship grew by conversion each day. Those who heard the gospel was responsible to accept Jesus Christ by a definite act of his will. The Lord's electing and adding does not rule out human responsibility. In turn, the saints show Christian love to those in the community as their numbers grew dramatically. God received glory and the people were blessed. In summary, this unit focused on God's people praising him. The fourth and final lesson in this unit highlights the power of praise and worship and creating unity and drawing others to Christ. Christian evangelism is effective when it is birthed from a unified worship. When the people in our world see genuine Christian love practiced in individual hearts and throughout the community, they will be drawn to know Christ. Building the Lord's kingdom requires a committed response. Sitting idle is not an option. God has called every believer to be engaged in worship, witnesses, and worship of the Lord. 
those who engage in this labor for the Lord willingly accept fellow Christians as spiritual brothers and sisters. Wonderful things happen when Christians come together to demonstrate their valuing over valuing of people over possessions. Bonds of unity grow stronger and new believers are drawn to Christ when Christians extend themselves to touch the needs of those within and outside their circle. The church community grows closer as Christians gather regularly for worship, prayer, and the Lord's Supper. Bible teaching and serving the needs of others. As we close this lesson out, in Matthew 7 and 16, Jesus declared that others would recognize Christians by their fruit, and in other words, by their love, a love that transcends at the ethnic, national, and socioeconomic barriers to become one in him. Again, this is a powerful lesson that we can demonstrate in our lives through evangelizing and being a witness for Christ. Again, let's continue to pray one for another. Let's continue to share this word for many church doors are closed and many have not made their mind up to head back to church, but yet God's word is powerful and is able to reach the highways and byways and airways all over the land, all because of the platforms and the devices we now have. And we thank God for every effort and every opportunity for us to stand in order to deliver the words unto the people. So let us pray. Merciful and gracious God, once again, we all stand in the need of prayer. So much is going on in our world. Sickness and pain and death. The pandemic is causing, Father God, economic falls. And, and we need you now more than we ever needed you before. And we pray now, Father God, that you'll intervene, intervene on behalf of your people. That you will forgive us for our sins and that you will heal the land and that you will lead and guide us every step of the way. And that those who are without you, Father God, those who are still in the world, that you will shine the light from heaven, Father God, and show them the way back to you. That they will turn from their wicked ways and that you will forgive their sin and that you will heal our land. We thank you, Father God, for the platform of the lesson. We thank you for allowing us to stand on behalf of yourself, Father God, to deliver your words unto your people. Bless these, your people now, everyone individually and collectively, everyone under the sound of my weak voice. Father God, we praise you. We worship you. We give honor to you. Bring us together in unit. Break every chain. Break every stronghold. Break every addiction, Father God. It, where we're divided, bring us together. Remove any hatred, Father God. Move any pride, any envy that will prevent us from joining together, Father God, in fellowship and breaking of bread, Father God. Help us to know that we need to come together like a chain link fence, Father God, bonded together that we may grow together and that we know that there's power when we join together. For you said in your word, we're two or three are gathered together in your name that you will be there in the midst. So we thank you today. We give glory, honor, and praise unto your holy name for you truly are worthy to be praised. It's in Jesus' name we pray and we say amen, amen, and amen again. Again, this is Pastor James Daniels, pastor of the Friendship Missionary Baptist Church, Volula, Alabama. God bless you, may keep you until we meet again.